And today we're going to be continuing on with our More to This Story series. And we're moving into week five of this study. So we've, we've covered a month's worth of Jesus' teachings and his parables. And each one, as we've talked about going along with the theme of the series, has been a parable story. And Jesus has been using these stories to illustrate some more complex topics. And he's breaking them down into more simple examples for people to follow along with. And I know it can be kind of hard to place ourselves back in those days because life today looks very different than what it looked like 2,000 years ago in Israel, right? But getting a formal education and going to school was not as common as what we see today. You know, a few weeks ago, maybe about a month ago, we probably saw a lot of pictures online on Facebook of kids standing in front of their houses. They got the book bags on, and they're excited to gear Some of them are excited to gear up for another school year, you know, and they're just waiting for the bus to come pick them up, and we see those pictures. Those are really cool to see. You know, it's interesting. It's, it's really fun to see the some people will post kind of like the year differences of what the kids looked like a few years ago and today and how they've grown and stuff like that. That's really neat to see. But, and, and though that's commonplace to see that today, you know, if we went back 2,000 years ago to this time in this place of Jesus' day, we would not see that, right? We wouldn't see that on Facebook, right? We wouldn't see all of the schools that are in almost every town that you go to. You definitely wouldn't see any school buses coming around to pick up kids to take them to schools, and getting an education back then was not a luxury that every person got to enjoy. And I know our kids may scoff at that idea that school is a luxury or something that you get to enjoy. But back then, you may have not gotten really any formal education. You may have not gone to any kind of school. And so something that could happen back then is uh, it was uh, somewhat of a common practice is sometimes younger kids, typically uh, little boys, they would be sent to synagogues and they would be taught how to read and how to write. And they would use the Torah as a basis of that teaching. So they'd kind of get a religious religious, uh, studies education in that process as well. And sometimes that's all you got. That was it. And that wasn't even an absolute either because not every place had the facilities to do that. So sometimes kids just learn from what their parents taught them at home, whether they're boys, girls, they're homeschooled. There's no curriculum to go by. There was no, all right, here's the books that you need. This is the curriculum you need to follow. You know, this is what you need to cover in the general studies, the history, the sciences, the math, nothing, right? Parents may have never received any schooling either. And so when Jesus would teach in a crowd of, you know, 4,000, 5,000 plus individuals, people gathered, he would certainly be aware that some of these people received a pretty decent amount of education. The religious figures would have been amongst that group. You know, if some of them had some money to them, even if they weren't religious figures, they could have had some arranged formal education and training. And then there were some in the group who weren't used to hearing lessons and teachings. And I imagine they were so happy to be able to do that but Jesus has been talking about some pretty deep stuff to this point. If we think back on the, what we've covered in the past month, it's been some pretty heavy stuff. And so, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that he's talking about that would leave intellectuals and philosophers scratching their heads. So these are high-level conversations that could be a bit hard for anybody to track along with. And so Jesus wouldn't avoid talking about these things, but instead he would use stories and ideas from farmers and and wedding celebrations and and things of that nature and shepherds and those were so much easier to track along with because people know those things pretty well and now we understand from our readings and stuff some people still didn't get the true meaning of the stories but as we see that reason wasn't because people couldn't understand but because they couldn't they weren't listening they weren't listening The religious figures were the examples of that, the prime examples. They had the educational backgrounds. They should have been able to take the lessons. They should have been able to take the the teachings and the different things that Jesus said. And yet, they oftentimes were left scratching their heads. And that was because we know that they weren't listening to kind of be a sponge and absorb, but rather they were listening to respond, to take what was said and throw them back at Jesus. Hey, Emerson. This is Emerson's first service, guys. This is exciting. So... And so that was a pretty effective method of teaching to everyone, right? It was a pretty effective method that Jesus did. So that people could follow along and learn and be able to take something from Jesus that would help them in their lives. Still translates today, too. Matt kind of gave us an example of that last week. Pastor Matt, when he gave us his message, 
Because when we hear stories and we go through the Gospels, we may hear, you know, them talking and, and Jesus like, all right, he's going from Capernaum to the Decapolis. Or he's going from Capernaum to the area of Bethsaida. We may hear that and be like, what does that mean? Okay. He went to Capernaum to the Decapolis. What does that mean to me? How far is that? I mean, they had to travel by foot. What does that even mean? Is that talking like from going from Wharton to Upper? Are we talking Wharton from Minnesota? Like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't have any idea. But if we say something like, all right, well, they uh, walk from the area of like the doorsteps of Wharton down to the uh, Horseshoe Stadium down in Columbus, that kind of paints a little bit of a picture. Like, okay, well, that's roughly so many miles. Man, it's a little bit of a track. We could, it takes this amount of time to drive at 65 miles per hour. It's a little distance. To have to walk that by foot, that's going to take a little bit of time, right? We would all have an idea of what those words mean rather than Capernaum and the Decapolis probably don't do for us. It's like saying your work performance in the past year has been like uh, the Patriots with Tom Brady. If somebody says that to you, you probably have an idea of like, well, that's not too bad. Tom Brady did pretty good when he played with the Patriots, right? If you ever saw me dancing, you may say something like, you know, he'd be a great addition to the Australian breakdancing team, if you've seen that video. And if you've seen that video, you would know that would not be a compliment to my dancing abilities, right? You may hear something like, you're as cuddly as a cactus. You're as pleasant as a traffic jam. You're as reassuring as a broken alarm clock. You could hear a variety of different things and sayings like that. And while we're probably all tracking with those things, none of these things that we've said would probably make a whole lot of sense to the audience hearing this back then. But we can all track with those pretty clearly. If you just said, you're as pleasant as a traffic game, people would be like, what are you talking about? We had like three donkeys on the road. I don't know what that means. Like that would, we have an easier idea of what that means. The picture of being cuddly as a cactus or your work as the quality of multi-year champions, that says more than just you're a bit cold or abrasive or you're, you're really good at your job. It brings to mind an image that is almost tangible. You can, you can almost hold that in your hand. It brings it to life. And that's what Jesus did, and he was really good at it, as we've seen so far in our studies. He wanted to be able to say, this is the story. This is what I'm trying to get you to imagine. I want you to place yourself into the setting. And then once he does that and he's able to get you to do that, he says, this is why I'm telling you this, and this is why it's significant. And we're going to see more of that today. Because at this point, Jesus has come to Jerusalem, and he's having his authority questioned by the religious figures. And the, uh, the animosity that is, is being brought forth from the religious figures has reached an absolute peak at this point in the story. Because Jesus came to the temple courts, and he saw all the religious figures as he gets to the temple courts in Jerusalem. He sees that they set up these, these selling booths um, at the temple courts. And, and you know, it's, it's a time of the year when people would come, and they would pilgrimage in, and they would go there for the festival. They would go there to worship together. So people would be coming from all over the place. And so the religious fig figure set up these booths to make a buck it was the time of the year and it's like oh we're gonna have a lot of people come let's try to let's try to take advantage of this time of the year let's make some money off of this whole deal and so that's what they did and not to go into the whole story of that to kind of keep it short but not only what they did was a greedy intention but it was a distraction for the people when jesus goes to the temple courts he sees that this area has become not it doesn't look like a place of worship it looks like a seller's market it looks like a marketplace and so when he gets there what he does is he goes up to the tables and he just starts flipping them he said, this stops right here and right now. No more. We're not doing it. And naturally, the religious figures were saying, what gives him the right to do what he just did? And so they tried to press him with questions and things in front of everyone. And so far in our study, we've seen Jesus talking about the good and the bad and some of the things that are going on, things that are going to come. And so we've seen a variety of different parables. But the one that we have today is going to be kind of directed towards the religious figures. We're going to see it stretches more uh, to the extenuating crowd, but it, it is aimed generally towards the religious figures, though it has meaning for everybody listening. So he's got a pointed response to some of the religious figures' questionings, and he wants to get them thinking. And as he does, he's got a landowner in mind again as he does it. And so let's go ahead and get into Jesus' words and see what he was getting at. And what these ideas can mean for us today as we go. And so we'll go ahead and dive into our text. It's in Matthew chapter 21. It starts in verse 33. It goes through verse 46 if you want to open your Bibles. If not, the text will be on the screen and it says this. It 
Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent the other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. Therefore, when the owners of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to the other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone who's, whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. And so as we dive into our text that we have today, we see that Jesus is in the process of talking about multiple things at the, the temple courts. This is a bit of an extended time. Because he finished up one parable that we're going to look at next week. It's called the parable of the two sons. Um, we're going to cover that next week. The sermon is done. I wrote a story in it that I'm, it is embarrassing. But I think I'm going to keep it in there. Something to look forward to. Um, but we're going to cover that one next week. The one following this is the, the parable of the wedding banquet. Um, So if we're familiar with that one, down a little ways we see the parable of the ten virgins that we um, studied a couple weeks ago. And then shortly after that, or before that, we see um, Jesus being questioned about paying the imperial tax to the emperor. And if that was a good thing, if we should be paying our taxes, or like this is an oppressive uh, regime, a government that we don't respect, we have oversight that we don't want, is it good to pay them our hard-earned money and pay our taxes? Do you think we should do that or not? So it's a bit of an extended teaching time. And like we said earlier, this is coming after the religious figures have come up to Jesus saying, what gives you the right to do what you did? What what makes you think that you can come over and turn over tables here? They were essentially telling Jesus, hey, that's not your place. We condemn what you did. We don't respect you. We don't like what you say. And we don't like what you do. I mean... That's already been pretty much felt to this point, if we know the gospel stories to this point. It's a plain and simple and clear message that they were sending to Jesus. And it was one that Jesus probably acknowledged, thinking, yeah, that sounds about right. Because that's how it's been throughout the history of time. It's not something new or unique. It's honestly much of the same that's been going on before as well. And Jesus starts talking about that reality with this parable. Because as he starts talking, he says, there was a landowner who planted a vineyard. And when he does that, we see he puts quite a bit of time and care into this vineyard. Because he doesn't just take some land and get some farmers and he said, go and make, go and do, do all of this. No. He sets everything up nicely and gets it all in running order. You know, he puts a wall up around the vineyard to keep the animals out. He builds a watchtower so people can watch for thieves. He builds a wine press right into the place so that they could squeeze the grapes right there where they were. Everything was set up so the farmers could come in, they could set up shop, and they would have everything they need. They just need to maintain things. That was the plan. And once he got everything set up, he brought in some farmers to come in and manage his place and make some good fruit here. And in that process, he was going to let them run things, and he was going to move on to the next place. And I can almost kind of picture that conversation of the farmers. Like, here, you guys go. Everything, you, you have everything here that you need to do what you do. You don't have to build anything. You don't have to invent any wheels here. Just everything that you need is right here. And I picture the landowner saying, everything is good to go. You can run with this. If you do the right things, you do what you're supposed to do. And I feel pretty confident you'll produce some good fruits here. This is a nice setup here. And when he's saying this and he's kind of showing the, the farmers around, I, w- I would think the farmers are thinking to themselves, this is a pretty good deal. This is pretty good. 
We get to move into this place for a decent fee. It's got everything that we want. It's a nice place. We can manage things here. We can make it our own. We'll be able to keep some of what we produce. We'll produce, so we'll make some money. All we have to do is tend to the vineyard, kick back some of the, the produced fruit back to the owner, and so in the long run, we're going to make money. And this is a good, this is a good thing. This is nice. This, everyone would want to be thinking, this sounds pretty good to me. And most back then would probably agree. This is a win-win arrangement that was made back in those days. It was a fair deal that the landowner says, this is what I'm going to do, and this is what I get. And this is what you will do, and this is what you can expect to get in the process. Everything was good to go. This sounds like a perfect situation that everybody's going to be happy with. Everything is good. What could possibly go wrong? Well, we see some time had gone by, and the farmers had been doing their thing. It was about the time where the fruits were coming along. And so when that time happened, some of them obviously thought, you know what? We don't really feel like giving the landowner anything. You know, he said because he gave us all this stuff that we should give a little back in return to him. But I don't really feel like doing that. And actually, I think I have a better idea. How about we take everything here that he says belongs to him, and now it's no longer his, it's ours. Everything that is done here, everything that we make, everything we do, that's no longer his, but it's ours. He's no longer the owner here. I am. That became their plan. So as time goes by, the landowner said, you know, it's about that time. I bet the farmers are going to have some good fruits ready to go. You know, let's see what they came up with and what they have and what they want to give over to me. So he sends some servants along to go collect the fruit from the farmers. And we should note here, um, it, I don't know if it stuck out to you. It did when I was kind of reading it here, and so maybe it did with you as well. But when it says he sent his servants along to collect his fruit, it almost sounds like collecting his fruit sounds like all of it. Like it sounds like it could be saying that all the fruit that's, uh, that's collected, it's, it's going to be his. But if we were to turn the pages to the Gospel of Mark, the same story is told there. And it actually says he sent his servants along to collect some of the fruit. And, and that's a better picture of the reality here because Matthew, as he's telling this story, is implying that everyone hearing this already knows that the fruit would not mean all of the fruit. It's kind of like during Thanksgiving dinner. If you were to say, like, I'm going to go get a plate full of turkey, we would all already assume that you didn't mean that you were going to go up and pick up the entire Thanksgiving turkey and put it on your plate and then carry it back to your seat. But you're probably saying you're going to get a portion of said turkey and you're going to fill up your plate with that amount. I don't know. Maybe you did mean you were going to pick up the whole Thanksgiving turkey. I don't know how y'all do Thanksgivings. But we wouldn't typically assume that sort of thing. And that's the implied wording here from Matthew here. It's not saying collect all of the fruit, but it's going to fill his portion of said fruit or turkey onto his plate. And so as the three servants went up to the place to tell the farmers, hey, this is why we've come. What do you have going on here? What can we bring back to the owner? The farmers respond with, you can have nothing. We have literally nothing for that landowner who sent you. And actually, I'm really glad that you came along to ask because we have a little message that we'd like to send, and you're perfect to be able to help us deliver that. And so when they said that, they went on out. They seized the three servants, and we're told that they beat, or the verb that's used could mean beat or whipped. So depending, maybe a combination of both, it could be mean, uh, mean they were beaten or they were whipped. The second one they killed, and the third one, it says that they were stoned. And so they were uh, killed by, uh, pelted by a, a series, a melee of stones, or close to it. And honestly, when, when that happened, when they did that, I don't know what they thought was going to happen next. It's kind of a peculiar moment. Like, what do you think was going to happen after that? Like, I don't know if they thought maybe if we flex our muscles here, then the landowner is just going to count his losses. Like, eh you know what, it's not worth my trouble. I'll just focus on the other vineyards. I'll worry about the other stuff. I'll just let him have it. But not only has a landowner been betrayed, he's now lost some servants in the process. And so if we were that landowner, if we can picture being in that situation, if we were the landowner, we created this whole vineyard, made everything, good to go, contracted some farmers to come in and do this. They stole the land, kill our servants in the process, how happy do you think you'd be with that? Probably not very happy. I'd be pretty upset, I feel like. like. And I'm sure the landowner, and we know the landowner, had the resources on standby to say, all right then, I'll just bring in a crew and forcefully remove you and take what's mine. If you want to go that route, we can go that route. 
I mean, the farmers are literally on his land killing his servants. That would be a very tough pill to swallow, I would think. That would be very frustrating. Honestly, I don't know how high my tolerance would be if that were me as the landowner. But the landowner decides to give the farmers another chance to turn things around and make things right in the end. And so he sends even more servants to collect his fruit that was owed. And this time was even more than the last time. And it wasn't even a show of force. It wasn't even a show of force. It was truly trying to mend the broken bridge that the farmers have done or created. And again, we see that the farmers treat those servants the exact same way as they did to the ones before. They beat those servants and they killed them yet again. And again, I imagine when the news gets back to Lander, it would have been so disappointing and hurtful that these farmers are doing these things to him and to his servants. But he says, you know what? Instead of sending more servants, I'll go ahead and I'll send my son to them. And now we can hear this story and objectively think to ourselves, like, we can see a trend here, right? Like, you're really going to send your son? The, any person that you sent, they've beaten and they've killed. Why are you going to send your son? Are you crazy? What do you think is going to happen here, right? But he said, those servants have carried my message, but my son carries my blood. So the farmers will know how serious this is, this is and they will respect him. So surely they will think twice before pulling what they did to the servants on my own son. And that would make sense back in those days. That would have made a lot of sense. Because doing something like that to a servant and to a rich man's son was two very different things. Those were two totally different things. You may try to pull that to a servant. You wouldn't dare to a rich man's son. You wouldn't dare. So surely they're going to have a different demeanor and a different attitude when the son approaches Right? Nope. They don't. In fact, when they saw the sun approaching, they actually were thinking about the, the ground on which they stood. And they said, here's the sun approaching. And he said, this is, this is the landowner's son. He's coming to get the fruits. So if we kill him, we have a claim to his inheritance. So it belongs to him from his dad. Let's just kill him off too. It's not his. It's not his dad. It's ours. Let's kill him. That's what they decide to do. And what's interesting as we see in our story, it says that the, the son actually makes it into the vineyard. He gets into the vineyard. He's standing in there. And when that happens, they seize him. They throw him out of the vineyard. And they have him killed. Just like they did to the servants who came before him. Would have been an unthinkable action. Unthinkable. And then the owner, when he would have found out about this, he would certainly have said something like, Guys, I've given you how many chances? I gave you everything, and this is what you give to back to me in return? I, I wanted this to be a good thing for, me, for you, but you ran off. Why? And to piece this story together, if we haven't already been able to connect this thought, this isn't a fictitious story that Jesus is telling here. You're speaking of God's people. And we can follow the stories throughout the Bible of God making ways for his people, and then people end up running off from him. And when they do that, God, what God has done is he sent the prophets to try to get them to come back. He sends the prophets and he says, come back, come back. And when God has done that, what did the people do to the prophets? They beat them, they stoned them, and they killed them. They did exactly what Jesus described in the story. But God still didn't give up on his people, even though the people really haven't held their end of the deal so well. They've taken the land, they've kept it all for themselves, and they've struck down anybody who's came to warn them against what they were doing. And Jesus is saying here that the Father sent him as well, even after all of the prophets. And yet what was soon going to happen was going to be the cross. What soon was going to happen was the cross, which is amazing because he's looking. He's telling this story. He's predicting what's going to happen to him right to the people who were going to do it. He was telling these people that the son was going to be killed to the people who were going to kill the son. And they still fully didn't even get it. When we talked this morning when our introduction about when, the, when he would teach the, the religious figures, they were some of the ones who had the hardest time understanding. They weren't listening to hear. And he was telling them, I'm going to be killed. And they're like, huh, is that so? Just as Jesus referenced the scripture in our text, the one the builder rejected, meaning the ones they're looking at, the ones they're questioning, and ultimately the one they're going to have killed is the cornerstone. He is the firm foundation. 
And the one they wanted to destroy is actually going to be the one who is going to save us all. And they said, what's an interesting thing is letter writing back in that day and, and writing down anything was a very expensive process um, to have the materials, to have somebody actually do that because that was a hired job typically. And so for that reason, we don't always see everything in the picture of our story. Sometimes we just get the main ideas. But I really like when we can see some of the other details that are going on in the story. And we actually are able to see that in this one. Um, because I don't know if you notice this, at the end of our text, it says that the religious figures knew that Jesus was talking about them. Didn't have to be in there, but I like that it was added. Which is kind of crazy to think about, that as Jesus was telling this story, I don't know how he was doing it, obviously he wasn't there, but I wonder as he was, do, he was telling these things to the crowd, I don't know if he made eye contact with any of them, or how, how that went, or if they, whatever, but I just kind of envisioned them just kind of like hearing this, and kind of leaning over to one another, as like, do you know what he's talking about? No? Do you think he's talking about us? Like, I feel like this might be about us. No. Yeah, no, it was. They were actually right on. They were, what they were sensing was absolutely accurate. They nailed it. But what Jesus was saying, y'all are doing it again. He's saying you're doing just what the people have done in the past. And some have taken what God has given them, their minds, their bodies, their hearts, the air they have in their, their lungs and everything in between. And they said, thanks, God. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that so much. No, if you could just see your way out, that would be great. Please exit left. Thank you so much. Please go. I'm no longer a renter. I'm no longer a worker. I am the owner. All of this belongs to me. And Jesus is giving this history lesson to explain this reoccurring thing that some people have done since the beginning of time, and that was promoting themselves from manager to owner. And he does that, and as he does that, he actually opens up to the audience at that point, he says, what do you think is going to happen when the owner comes and sees those farmers? What do you think he would do? What would you do if you were the owner? And he leaves it open to the audience. And the audience says something around the fact of like, well, that's probably going to be the end of that. Like that relationship will probably end right there at that point. What they actually said is those will be brought to a wretched end and the owner will find others to manage the vineyard. And now he's tur th that's specifically speaking of, at, at a larger picture, the nation of Israel in the church, because the religious figures were held of, of managing both those things, and as we know, they didn't do a very good job of doing that. But it sounds an awful lot like he's not going to continue that existing relationship with those who continue to turn away from him. And I would think at some point, you know, as the religious figures, if we're in 21 chapters uh, uh, covered, the Gospel of Matthew. He's taught a lot. He's gone through a lot of parable teachings. And I wonder, because, I mean, I've been going through this for four weeks, and I've kind of wondered as we've gone through this, is like, well, where do we fit into this grand scheme? Like, we're somewhere in the midst of this story. We're not at the beginning. We're not quite at the Where are we? Where do we fit into God's plan? I wonder if the religious figures thought that at all. Right? They have an important role. They have a high position in those days, an important one. They carried the role of being the messengers of God's words. They were supposed to be God's faithful, an integral part of carrying his message and word forward. But in the process of that, some of them got greedy. Some of them let lying and deceiving others become a standard practice. Some of them started making exceptions for themselves that they were happily ready to condemn others for doing the same thing. They got so wrapped up in everything that they were doing that they got lost. And while it probably wasn't intentional for most, or at least, we'd, at least we'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt that they weren't doing that on purpose, somehow God had moved from the driver's seat to the back seat. And honestly, that's not that hard of a trap to fall into for us today either. It's very easy to have happen. Because we may have caught ourselves doing the same sort of thing at times too. We may relate to this, but we may have said something like, you know, Jesus is my king. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. He's got my heart. He's got my life. He's got it all. And yet we may have made plenty of decisions that look more like our calls, our decisions, our choices, more, like a, more than a good king's orders did. And even though God has given us instructions on how to run these vineyards called our lives, at times we've all probably said, you know what? I think I got this one. I think I can handle this one. God, take a seat, relax, I got this. And then we run the vineyards how we, that we've been given how we want to. 
And I'm not sure about you, but that hasn't always worked out super well for me when I've done that. Hate or anger is not going to help my field grow. Hate or anger is not going to help my field grow. Idolatry is not going to produce the fruits that I want. Dishonesty is not going to cultivate a bountiful harvest. But sometimes we can kind of throw these things into the mix and we just kind of hope they don't interfere with the good stuff that we have going on. But usually with time, we see that those bad things have a way of messing things up in our lives. Which, I mean, God tries to warn us from because when he set up these whole things, these vineyards, he said, this is the framework because I'd really like to see you produce good fruits. I'd really like for this to be a really good thing for you. But he says, how you manage it's up to you. He said, I'm letting you choose that. And in some ways, they've all probably been like these farmers who have decided to take the rain on things at times. But as we reflect on this story, and we reflect on our stories, where is God in the mix of all of that? Because Scripture tells us that we can build our house or our lives on one of two places. The Scripture says the wise one will build their house on the rock, but the foolish will build their house on the sand. And in that story, we see that the house that's built on the rock could withstand the storms, the winds, and all the troubles of life. And it made it through because of the firm foundation that it had beneath it. But the sand was too flimsy, couldn't bear the storms, and the house fell apart. Jesus says today, I am the cornerstone. I am that firm foundation. So he says, will you build your life on me? Will you trust me to do that? Will you share your life with me so that I can help you grow? Are you going to keep your gates closed? Will you try to run this vineyard on your own? And so often when we open those gates, and I I feel like we all probably have, like, no, my gates are open. I am good. Absolutely. But I feel like this is a relatable thing. I I feel like we've probably all done this at, at certain points, but sometimes we keep our open gates kind of like one of those partial house tours when somebody just stops over at your house. If they just stop over and they're like, hey, I was just in the neighborhood. Like, I haven't seen the house. Do you mind if I just, like, come in and take a look around? You're like, absolutely. One minute. Um, And then we go and we grab all of our stuff and we throw our junk in the laundry room. We shut that. We're definitely not going to show them the the bedrooms upstairs. We're not going to go to the basement because all the water damage. So it's like, absolutely, God, come on in. Let me show you around. We're not going to go in that room. We're not going over there. We're not going to look at that, right? We're not going to look at the, that end of the house or that end of the field where my hobbies are or where, you know, maybe my marriage is right now because those things don't look how they should. They could use some repairs before I have you see those. Like, I really can't give you access to things like my finances and the things that cause me to feel shame that I keep way in the back of the property behind the shed where nobody can see it. And sometimes we keep God on a bit of a limited entry. Yeah, God, you can come on in, but... There's certain things I can't give you access to. There's things I can't have you see. But that's the thing with God. Is ever since the beginning of creation, we see everything that he does and everything that he makes is good. Think about what Jesus did. When he would touch, eyes would open. Ears would start hearing. People who had legs that didn't work started walking again. People who were sick were restored, and broken things were made new again. And we we, we have them come into our vineyard, and sometimes we're like, "Eh, just don't look over there, don't touch that sort of thing. But he wants all of us, the good and the bad, that's what he wants to do with our vineyards and our lives. And we know godly living and godly wisdom and our relationships with our friendships and our jobs with our finances, with our kids, all of those things, if we do them well, will undoubtedly produce good fruits in our lives. We can see that from the pioneers of the faith that have gone before us. The example has been set. We know it. It's a grand design, and it almost seems so simple that it can't be true. But it is. Sometimes we can just have a hard time carrying that forward. It's called being a Christian sometimes. We fall short of the standard. We don't always hit the mark like we're supposed to. We fall down. We mess up. But what we're supposed to do is to say our, sor- say our sorries to those we hurt, to say our sorries to God, and to keep our hearts not as a locked gate, not as the partial house tour that we have, like, oh, man, we're 
real quick. Not that, but a complete open gate to the owner who wants to come in and help us to produce good fruit in our lives. So may we remember that. That doing life on our own and keeping the owner out is only going to serve to hurt us. I I get that we want to have control on what we do and when we do that. We want to steer our ships. I get that. But why don't we let the one who knows the best place to go lead the way? He's got the map. He's got the compass. He knows the right ways to go. Why don't we just take his advice? Follow it. Let's keep giving him more of our lives. And so as we close this morning, how are our hearts doing? Are there things that are weighing on you? Do do you feel like you're kind of a mixed bag right now that I got some good fruits over here, but I got some bad fruits that are really weighing me down? Are we feeling like, my goodness, I'm just waiting on some good fruits to pop up. I could use a little good news come my way. I'm waiting. (sighs) There's an owner who's waiting at your gate. And he wants to help you turn those things around. And I know that he can. Because I've seen him do it in my life. I've seen him do it in a lot of people's lives. Individuals in this room as well. We serve a God who is a way maker, a miracle worker, a chain breaker. And if we give our life to him, fully give over our hearts, we will see a victory. Because the one who will be with you is never lost. That is our king. That is who he is. And so if we got some good fruits, we got some blessings in our hearts and our lives, let's remember to, to thank him for those. Let's give him praise for those things. But as we leave, what is an area of our lives that if we let him in, he might be able to touch that and make it a little bit better? Why don't we continue to work with a good owner and continue making that good fruit that we can be proud of this week as we go? So now at this time, We will go ahead and pray as we turn our hearts and our focus to the Lord's table together. I must say before we pray, Emerson did fantastic. That was a good. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we're able to gather here. And God, we just ask that you're with us as we turn our hearts and our mind to your table. God, we ask that you would help us to look into our hearts this morning. Help us to bring any unrighteousness to you. For you are the great king who can remove our offenses. God, be with us as we remember what you've done for us as we take these elements together as a church family. God, let this time not not just be another communion, but a time where we would look into our hearts and know right now that you are bringing us to your table. You have made a spot for us here today. God, help us to not take that for granted. God, we just ask your spirit be upon us, touch our hearts, and that we would be led to you in this time. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward as we distribute the elements.
to read from Scripture, we're told that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he was with the disciples in the upper room, and he had before him the typical Passover meal, the bread and the wine. He looked at his disciples that were gathered and said, I'm eager to eat this meal with you, for I will not eat a bread or drink of wine until I take it again in the kingdom of heaven. As they finished the meal, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, broke it, said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, given for you, to do this in memory of me. And he took the cup, again he gave thanks and praise, gave it to the disciples, saying, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He said, do this in memory of me. He was foreshadowing a day that was to come. He was nearing the day where he paid the penalty for all of our sins, the price that he paid willingly. His sacrifice for all of us wasn't anything that we could earn. It was a gift we couldn't buy on our own. All we had to do this morning is accept that gift. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave right to become children of God. You're a child of the greatest king, a child of God who loves you so much that Jesus was willing to be killed so that we may live. Let what he has done resonate in your heart this morning. Again, this is the body of Christ, broken for you, willingly and freely, that he, choice that he made. Do this in memory of me. Take and eat when you're ready in your heart. This drink signifies the blood of Christ, which sealed the covenant of God. If you remember Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, it says, I will remember your sins no more, declares the Lord. I will be your God, and you will be my people. I will no longer write my law on stone tablets, but rather I will write them on your heart. You cannot out the blood of Christ. When we look upon the blood of the Lamb, we remember the Passover story and the blood that was poured over the doorposts that we see in the book of the Exodus. And we remember that the angel of death passed over all of the Jews. And when we look to Jesus Christ, the perfect and spotless lamb, the angel of death will pass over all who come under him. This is the blood of your Lord poured out for you. Take and drink when you are ready. And let us pray together as a church family as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. Thank you for allowing us to, to gather in this place for the wonderful church and the church family that we have here. We have the ability to have the instruments and the, and the worship and all the smiles and laughter in this place. And that's a blessing. I would just ask as we leave this place that you would help us look more like you. There's so many things going on. There's so many distractions and sometimes it can be hard not to get lost in it all. But God, at the end of the day, we know that it's not about what we have. It's about where we want to go and the road that we take that, we, that helps us get there. And we know the way to get there. It's through love and compassion for others and our faith and relationship with you. So help us forgive when we do wrongs. And at God, we ask that you forgive us for when we mess up. And may we continue to aim to be the love this community needs, to see you in all that we do. And God, we ask that you be with us as we join together in song to give you praise. For God, you are worthy of it all. Be with us as we close. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. For those who are able, would you please stand as we give God more worship through song.
as we leave this place, you have more bricks you're going to be laying on your life. And you're going to keep tending to that vineyard. Why don't we lay those bricks on a solid foundation, on the cornerstone that will never fail us. Everything we build on the rock will never fall. So build your life on Jesus. And you can be sure your vineyard will have plenty of good fruit to show from it. Jesus took a cross and turned it into an empty tomb in three days. So trust him to work in your situations you face. Lean into his love and care and provision as you go. We're in good hands. And we praise God for that today. So let's pray as we leave this place. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to sit and reflect on your words. God, all that you've done. God, you've shown us the right ways to go. And we know they're good ones. But to live them out well, we're going to need you. So help us to remember these words when we need them. We know we all want a good life, and God, through you, we can have that. To help us to continue seeking you with our decisions, with our time, and with everything we do. As we leave here, help us to savor all the precious moments that we have ahead of us. And we ask you to give us rest in this day, that we may glorify you in both word and deed as we go. And it's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Thanks for being with us this morning.